It's the After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Yes, welcome to the After Show. It's day one of the Open RAN Summit and we are live on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the first of two live Q&A shows. We have our final program for you tomorrow at the same time. Now, we started our Open RAN Summit today with panel discussions that looked at the total cost of ownership of Open RAN and also the integration of deployment models and blueprints. We've already received a lot of questions from you on these topics and several of our panelists are back to help answer during this live show. If you haven't yet sent in a question, then please do so now using the Q&A form here on the website. There's also a poll question and we are asking you, which of these are the most important areas of focus for the Open RAN community during the next 12 months? So go ahead, cast your vote now and select whichever ones you think are the most important. And we'll be looking at the results later in the show. As always, your co-host for the after show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Ray, we also spoke with Vodafone about the development of the RIC and got the latest Open RAN news from BT. Plenty of insightful observations there. Yeah, absolutely, Guy. I mean, it's always really interesting to see what uh, particular operators are focused on or not, of course. And in uh, BT and Vodafone, you have two operators with a different view of how Open RAN in general can play a role during the next few years, uh, while at the same time, both have identified the tremendous potential of the RIC, the RAN Intelligent Controller. So they're definitely in agreement there. Uh, and as for the roundtables and the questions we already have in, I think the challenges of integration and deploying multi-vendor disaggregated networks is going to dominate our live shows this week, Guy. Yes, many questions still remain over integration and deployment. And it's great to see different strategies towards Open RAN. Right, on with the show. So let's now meet our guests who are eager to help with all of your questions. And joining us live on the program today are John Baker, SVP Business Development at Mavenir, Rima Iontel, Chief Architect, TME Technology Strategy and Execution Office at Red Hat, Konstantin Polykonopoulos, Vice President of 5G and Telco Cloud at Juniper, Francis Hayson, Principal Analyst with Appledore Research, and Aitor Garcia Binas, RAN Strategy and Planning Manager at Vodafone. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. We've got so many audience questions to get through today. I really do think we've set a new record. Ray, do you have our first question? Uh, yes, I do. Thanks, Guy. And uh, so, Constantine, we're going to give this one to you to start off with. <clears throat> and the question is, what is Open RAN's most important objective? Uh, have we achieved it yet? And if not, how can we still achieve this objective? So, Constantine, what do you think is the most important objective for Open RAN and has it been achieved yet? That's a great question, um, overload question. I would say the most important objective is to accelerate the pace of adoption of new technologies, reap the benefits of new technologies in the RAN. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, to get there, of course, disaggregation is a key objective of Open RAN. Uh, and um, from disaggregation, the next big question is Open APIs, right? Exactly what Oran drives. And uh, the adoption of uh, the radio intelligent controller, which becomes the brains of the radio, the operating system of the radio. If we get those three done, um, I think the uh, ultimate goal will be right next to us. Uh, are we there yet? Um, I think we're well on our way. Uh, more collaboration between the, the various technology vendors and the operators, of course, uh, will, uh, will accelerate again, uh, getting to the ultimate destination. 
I don't think we are there yet per se, but I think the progress has been phenomenal over the last year or two in particular. Okay, great. Thank you, Constantine. And uh, Francis, we'll come to you next and then to John. So, Francis. Yeah, I, th I think the other area I think that's really important with open RAN, and we've seen this with other technologies where effectively something is disaggregated, is the whole idea of innovation that um, at the moment we really have a RAN that is designed for one thing, which is mobile broadband. Um, and uh, the opportunity in open RAN is, is a means by which we can think about tailoring that uh, to specific use cases, to specific industries, potentially in sp uh, specific enterprises. You know, the needs of handover and spectrum management within a private network, for example, are very different than that in a um, typical uh, national operator. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we've got with Open RAN is initially, you know, basically Open RAN is trying to replace a RAN. It, it is another RAN. But I think the opportunity that, that we shouldn't lose sight of is this opportunity for innovation. And we don't know quite what all those options for innovation are at the moment. Okay, yes. Uh, innovation, of course, does crop up uh, an awful lot in discussions about uh, Open RAN. Uh, so, John, we'll come to you next. Uh, what is Open RAN's most important objective and uh, have we achieved it yet? Yeah, and I'd like to bring it back to some basics. You know, Open RAN is about open interfaces and interoperability. Um, it's not necessarily defining any technology. It's allowing technology innovation um, and you know, the other main effect through open interfaces is to bring in sort of vendor diversity of uh, new vendors in the RAN space. And, uh, you know, being in Mavenair, you know, we can honestly say that that's truly happened. New vendors are in, in, in the marketplace and we're seeing a lot of innovation. But, um, you, you know, I think we've achieved one or two of the goals, but, um, you know, innovation is uh, uh, wide open and waiting to see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's some of the things have stayed the same in the last couple of years about the objectives uh, around Open RAN and certainly broadening the uh, supplier ecosystem and introducing greater innovation to the RAN, you know, has cropped up uh, time and time again. So these uh, still seem to be uh, on the same track there with the industry. Okay, uh, great. Thank you for those uh, responses. Uh, Guy, like you said, plenty of questions to get through. So let's go across to you for the next one. Yep, thanks, Ray. Absolutely, lots to get through. Um, next viewer question we have, and uh, Rima, let me address this one to you first. The question is, what is the most challenging issue encountered in the deployment of open RAN networks today? All right, um, at the risk of making lots of people dislike me, um, I have to say it's a bit of a legacy attitude that both the vendors and the service providers are bringing to the table. We are seeing a lot of talk about the new uh, development, but not enough action in actually adapting uh, the new ways of developing things. And what I mean is, um, vendors have invested in, uh, you know, the development over the years, so they want to reap as much from what they already have as possible, so they reuse a lot of stuff. Um, they also have their established development shops that have the processes that they used to, and they keep using them. Basically, what happens when you introduce something like Oren into the picture um, that requires utilization of these new platforms, completely different from what service providers used to have. Um, and you try to fit these uh, pieces of software that were developed in the old legacy way. You run into problems with deployment, you run into problems with upgrades, and uh, you basically slide back into the uh, business as usual model of the service providers. And basically, the, they want to be able to move forward quicker. They want to introduce new services faster. But if they cannot upgrade, like you see in IT shops every few weeks, or like overnight, which is you know Nirvana, but even every few weeks or every few months, what they still have to face is they can only upgrade every 18 months. 
their life cycle management is not uh, ready to move to the new uh, paradigms. So uh, that's really what I'm seeing. Uh, and on top of that, um, you still, even with all the talk of open APIs and open interfaces and interoperability, we are still seeing a lot of one-to-one -one relationships in open RAN. For instance, DU to RU, the front hall interface. Um, have you seen diversity there? I'm not seeing that much of it. And I'm worried that we're going to encounter the same once Rick is introduced into the network. So those are two of my biggest worries in seeing how people are adapting to open rent. Thanks, Rima. Good honest answer there. You know, we, we, we can't shy away from the challenges that, that we face with, with open run. Uh, Francis, let me come across to you for comments on this question. Yeah, I was going to slide this, um, build, build on Rima's comment. I, I think one of the biggest challenges is the whole procurement model um, within telcos, that um, telcos aren't built at the moment. They're, certainly their procurement departments aren't built to buy a disaggregated RAN. They're built to buy a RAN or um, RAN from multiple suppliers. Um, and, and, that, and that's a challenge because a lot of the, the mentality associated with the procurement process is, is not just one of the technology or the opportunity, but it's the, it's the ability to have operational guarantees, um, depending on your view, either one hand to shake or one th um, throat to choke um, type, of, uh, type of attitude. And that's a problem when you've disaggregated this because you're bringing lots of things, lot, lots of things together um, that don't have that automatic sort of single ownership. Um, I think there's, uh, it's, it's a challenge that still needs to be overcome, which is, which is people that can step up to take that role of integration, whilst to Rimmer's point, actually still in, actually re in reality, having a multi, multi vendor and multi solution in the, in the open RAN area. Thanks, Francis. So still issues around procurement here. Uh, John, over to you for your comments. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I very much agree with the comments about the legacy vendors and stuck in their old ways of working. Um, I, I, you know, to the comment of uh, interoperability, I think you know there's been multiple plug fests, you know, held by the Erwin Alliance around the globe, um, and also you know there's been multiple uh, integrations going on between DU vendors and radio vendors. Um, on a global basis, and I think as Mavini, we've done nearly nearly fourteen different radio vendors um, in the process of integrating their radio. So it's happening. Um, the multi vendor situation is 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 is, is in place, and, and Dish actually is a good proof of content, you know where they've used multiple radio manufacturers and they've used multiple CUDU manufacturers and brought all this together in uh, with what is now a live network. Right. Thanks very much, John. Thank you all for your comments on this one and this this. The whole issue of challenges is not going to go away. I'm sure we'll be um, asking very similar questions in a, in a year's time. Uh, Ray, let's uh, pop over to you for our next viewer question. Okay, thanks, Guy. Uh, and Francis, we're going to come to you first on this one. Uh, and the question uh, looks like it's off the back of the roundtable discussion. The question is, what is the TCO comparison over five years of an open RAN system versus a similar stack from established vendors? This really is a multi-billion dollar question. Francis, what's the answer? Well, I think very simplistically, um, as an analyst firm, I've, I've heard various figures between about 10% and, and, and up to 30% in terms of TCO cost. But I think you have to ask this question, what is TCO? And, and we, we discussed that on, on, on the panel session. I think there's definitely an opportunity from Open RAN in terms of being able to leverage um, the benefits of commodity hardware in some or uh, major parts of the, the, RAN net, the RAN network, the ability to leverage private cloud and even public cloud in that, in that area in terms of costs um, to deploy and, and most particularly actually costs to scale. Um, but I think the other, the, the, the other important thing, and I'll come back to uh, my earlier answer, which is it's a lot of the TCO will be about not just in terms of minimizing what exactly you do today. It's it's what is your opportunity to do something more in this in this area. 
to be much more relevant to an enterprise, to be much more relevant to particular new use cases. I, I, I used a very poor example, which is Pokemon Go. How could you react in a way that the RAN is much better at, at delivering a Pokemon Go ex, ex, experience? We don't have that ability. We, we have something that's fit, uh, fitted in. If you could react in a way that the, the, the leverage that, that's an opportunity for revenue. And that needs to be factored into the TCO um, calculations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a great question, but it's a it's a tough question to ask, uh, to answer, uh, particularly at the moment. Um, if we don't have any more uh, takers for this particular question, uh, then I think we'll uh, go back to you, Guy, at this point of the program. Yep. Thanks very much, Ray. And just a reminder to our viewers, we have a whole panel discussion, as Francis said, on TCO. Uh, it's well worth your time to check that out. Right. It's time now to have a look at our audience poll for our Open RAN Summit. As you said earlier, one question, seven answer options, and you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant. And just to remind you, the question we are asking this week is, which of these areas are the most important areas of focus for the Open RAN community during the next 12 months. And you can see the real-time votes right here. I scan down this list, it looks like, well, here you go. TCO is leading the field there with 58% of respondents. Don't forget that these, these figures indicate how many of our respondents chose that particular area of focus. So 58% of all our respondents to this poll have said so far that TCO is an important area to look at over the next 12 months. But quite honestly, the field is quite wide open. It's quite evenly spread there. Now, if you have yet to vote, then please do so. The more votes, the better. We are keeping the polls open and we'll take a final look at the results in tomorrow's live after show. So back to our Q&A, we've got another, what's that, about 25 minutes or so remaining. So we do have plenty of time for more of your questions. Ray, what have you got next for the panel? Okay, thanks, Guy. Uh, some interesting uh, results there uh, on, on the poll. Um, so this next question from the audience, uh, we're going to put this one to, to John first. Uh, and the viewer is asking, um, well, it's, it's a little bit of a statement as well, but uh, somebody's watched the round table and said, listening to the round table discussion on integration and deployment, my key takeaways are if integration is not what is not done, don't worry, go ahead and do it yourself. Standards not completed, don't worry, go ahead and solve the issues as you move along. TCO what you need, not what you need, don't worry, revenues will come. So I think that the, the point that this person is making, and they, they mentioned as well, you know, don't worry about the, the RIC not being ready yet. Uh, it'll come in in a few years time. I think the, the question, uh, the, the point this questioner is asking is that there doesn't seem to be an awful lot uh, ready to go or uh, there's a lot of questions unanswered um, so far. And this isn't a, a, a great position to be in to be able to think about a, a solution that could be deployed at scale. Um, John, is this a fair analysis uh, of the situation? Are there too many unknowns for a lot of operators to make a, a big commitment to open RAN at this point? Or do we need to think, does the industry need to think about open RAN in a different way? Uh, good, good question. And, 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 you know, I've been very vocal on parts of this subject as well. And, uh, you know, I think certainly, you know, Open RAN needs to be thought about differently in, in a sense of what it's trying to do. Um, you know, in essence, all we've done is open one of the critical interfaces that's been locked down for the last 15 years in the RAN. And, 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 you know, gratefully that's opened up this whole dialogue and debate and industry, you know, for the first time in 15 years. So, you know, we've achieved that goal. Um, you know, the interfaces specifications have, have evolved over the last uh, five years since it started with XRAN and moved into ORAN with the front hall interface. And that front hall interface now is in actually the, almost the third generation specification. So the specifications are solid, the specifications are sound. Um, the other elements that came out of the creation of uh, virtualized RAN essentially were such as the RIC interface. Um, you know, started later in time and is, you know, is in a different phase of the development process. And so 
Um, you know, there's a numbers of specifications that are going to come out later later this year. Now, to put it all in context, this is no different from you know to, to 3GPP in the way 3GPP brings out releases of specifications and updates, etc. Um, it's just happening faster, and, and I think that's part of some of the uh you know noise that you're hearing out there now this is this has also been used as noise by the existing OEMs to say that things are not ready um and again you know i reference you know work that's been done within Vodafone's network within uh Rec, you know within Rakuten within Dish's network specifications are being proven they've been interoperability has been proven that you know equipment has got specifications at a vo- at a various version level um, so, you know, this whole thing about not being ready is, is, is completely uh, noise. You, you, you know, it's, it's, it's ready, it's being dis- deployed in scale, um, and the, the, the network concepts will continue to evolve. And, and with innovation, you will get new products, new specifications, new interfaces. And that's the world we've lived in, in you know, for the last uh, 30 years with uh, 3GPP. And it's going to, but it's continuing faster, and it's got a whole bunch of new vendors that are excited about doing things, and that's that's why you see the speed of speed of change is increasing, and 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 you know potentially it's seen as some ambiguity, if you like, to others that you know are not involved in the process. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Constantine, let's come to you next. Um, uh, do you understand that there might be some concerns uh, of people out there that maybe there are there are still a few too many unsolved uh, or unanswered questions or, or um, standards or specifications that, that aren't quite ready yet? That, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, th- there is a lot of, uh, I think I would call it, I would dare call it misunderstanding. Um, I have to agree with uh, pretty much everything that John said. I think uh, we, Oran, the Oran community has reached a level of maturity that I think we're ready for prime time. Um, somebody mentioned, I think part of your question said, you know, when the RIC will be ready in a couple of years. As a matter of fact, the RIC is deployable today. At Juniper, we have a uh, RIC already in field, uh, field trials uh, with Vodafone, for example. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, uh, we are just uh, a couple of months away from uh, GA announcement of the RIC, uh, working with several radio vendors that we have integrated, several applications. Uh, that we have demonstrated in plaque fests, uh, in uh, actual trials. So we are ready. Um, many vendors like, uh, you know, Mavenir and Alpia Star, et cetera, uh, have demonstrated the ability to deploy uh, Oran based DU, CU, uh, working with um, uh, RU vendors uh, to demonstrate the end to end deployability of a complete Oran architecture. So we are, we are there. Have we reached the scale? No. Um, are we going to uh, uh, run into, you know, challenges? Yes, but let's look at the big picture. And the big picture is that Oran moves from a rigid run architecture that you cannot really change um, to a software-driven, software-based architecture that you can uh, eventually treat like, uh, as uh, Rima said, as an IT shop, right, where you can keep upgrading all the time without worrying about disrupting operations, disrupting the, you know, subscribers or the enterprise users, et cetera, right? You can, you know, you can keep upgrading. The life cycle becomes a lot easier to manage. And most importantly, adoption of innovation of new solutions that gives the, you know, operators the ability to address uh, new business models, you know, differentiation, et cetera. So the opportunities, I think, are limitless. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the human factor, you know, really needs to be taken into account here. Change is not always uh, uh, something that that everybody wants. Uh, Francis, um, you know, uh, are there reasons to be uh, more reasons to be bullish than to be cautious? Do you think? Yeah, I, I think there's some very good reasons to be bullish about this one. And I think that there's two areas we've already talked about innovation. But I think the fundamental thing about a lot of these concerns is. We're used to buying RANs that are based on hardware. They're based on silicon. They're based on things that you you have to think about five years in advance because somebody's going to have to build some silicon and 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 effectively hard code that into the silicon. The the, the open RAN is mainly uh, uh, you know apart from 
uh, as you get closer to the radio, most of it's now about software. And, and the, the dynamics of software are just completely different. You can literally, you can adapt to areas of a software interface. That doesn't mean you want to have some crazily um, divergent standards between uh, between software, but it does mean you can innovate ahead of the standard. You can um, make things work work together in, in, in a way that maybe wasn't originally anticipated by a, a standard. You, uh, you can just develop at a faster faster level and also react and change to correction and all the rest of it. And, and, and that deals, I think, with a lot of the challenges that are in the question. The other area, I think, is, is, is the whole area of risk, which is some, some of this is about your willingness to take a risk. If all you want to be is a continued mobile broadband um, solution, then that's... Uh, sure. Wait, wait for the standard. Wait, wait for somebody to encapsulate open RAN. But if you want to do something different, you want to be ahead of the curve. Um, then, then open RAN is an opportunity to take take risk, but also to take opportunity. And we, we we've seen that already with open RAN. Rakuten, um, Rakuten initially went forward with a, an open RAN like standard with Nokia well ahead of the standard and has been able to leverage benefit from that well ahead of the standard being available. Okay, yeah, definitely a, a risk factor involved there. I mean, Rima, do you think that, um, you know, uh, these, uh, this, some of the caution out there in the industry really is about sort of not really being able to get to, to grips with uh, how this feels on a day-to-day -day basis about the chain or all, all the changes you were talking about uh, earlier that that need to come into into factor yes um definitely some people have that reservation uh you know about having to change their whole uh, mode of operations but we have to remember one advantage we have here is we are all working to one standard uh there is a consensus that this is the standard. We don't have the story of, um, say, 4G when we had two competing standards, uh, WiMAX, LTE, uh, that people had to hedge their bets on which one they were going to support, which one was going to take uh, precedence. Um, so, you know, you had to wait and see and, uh, you know, try and accommodate both. Here, we know exactly what we're working for. We know that it's primarily software based and what we need to strive towards is keeping it that way, uh, right? Going away from our dependency on the underlying hardware infrastructure, as I think Francis mentioned, is crucial here. And another aspect is, even if you try to adapt something that's extremely adventurous and uh, you know cutting edge and it doesn't work out, um, it doesn't have to be a huge investment. Uh, you can dip your toe into it out and throw it away if it doesn't work or build upon it if it does. Uh, there's so many opportunities now. Uh, you don't have to build your own infrastructure. You can use other people's infrastructure to try stuff out. You don't have to roll things out to your whole network. You can just roll it out to a tiny little um, section without actually making any huge changes to anything. Uh, and that's what people need to uh, internalize, if you will, uh, understanding that that's the, you know, the present that they're living in. They do not have to commit to big changes. They can do it step by step, little by little. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's clear that that's what we're seeing with some of the operators that are a bit further forward um, in their in their plans, not the green fields, the the, the brown fields. So, okay, uh, great insights there. Thank you for those answers, uh, Guy. I think we'll we'll move on at this point and over to you for the next question. Yep, thank you, Ray. They were they were great insights. Uh, enjoyed those comments. Uh, Aitor, question for you here, and this this question's come from a viewer that's obviously watched your earlier panel discussion and specifically got a Vodafone element attached to this question. Let me read the question out for you. What is your timeline for large-scale open RAN deployment in Vodafone's commercial network? Okay, um, so I mean, we, we, we already announced the first site uh, going live, uh, 
um, it's not a full open run flavor what, what we are aiming to, but I mean, we need to consider that we are a little bit learning on this complex uh, path. I mean, part of the uh, innovation is about taking risk. And for this purpose, of course, I mean, we, we have been doing our first trials and first uh, site being deployed. Our, our objective this year is to bring a golden cluster of a uh, number of tens of sites where we are going to be introducing all the bands that we are planning to deploy, uh, starting from 700 to, to 3.5. Um, it's all the technologies, it's, uh, it's remote ready units, it's massive MIMO, so we are, we are going uh, fully to this uh, golden cluster. Um, and basically, I mean, we are selecting a number of sites to make sure that we are doing things as we are expecting. So we are not uh, having as a target to uh, degrade the customer performance. Basically, it's about making sure that everything is mature as expected. As I said, we are on the, on the learning process uh, and, and issues will come. I mean, this is not about waiting. We are active. We, we try to learn. We cope with the issues and move ahead. And basically, this, I mean, we will go to rural, we will go to urban this year, and we will start our mass deployment uh, next year. As we have been announcing in, 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 in the media, so we have a plan to deploy 2,500 sites in, in UK, that's in the next five years, but also our group CDO announced in the Mobile World Congress that we are planning to do minimum 30% of our European uh, sites on network uh, with open run. That's over 30,000 sites, right? So, I mean, we are starting now. We are not stopping here. We, are, we will understand the, the maturity level and we are already discussing and preparing some other uh, deployments that are, are need, uh, need to happen. So we, we are sure about the maturity level and we learn because this is a collaborative effort that we all need to learn. And, 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 and that's, uh, that can be uh, basically achieved by, by starting as soon as we can. Thank you, Aitor. There's, there's so much interest in what Vodafone's doing, obviously being one of the, the leaders and pioneers in, in Open Run. So uh, we expect these questions. You know, it's not just at vendors, it's, it's other operators who, who are anxiously looking at, at what you're doing, see how they can, how they can deploy in their own networks as well. So uh, thanks for that update. Um, Ray, let's get back over to you for our next viewer question. Okay, thanks, Guy. Um, so the next question, and this is uh, very uh, focused on uh, integration and that particular challenge. Uh, and the question is, uh, um, integration uh, is an issue. Who is going to take end-to-end -end responsibility at the installation phase? And who will take end-to-end -end responsibility in the long run? Uh, I mean, so this is a question I think, you know, we've probably heard multiple times uh, I heard at a, a, a panel session recently uh, in Germany. Uh, this question crops up all the time. So, would anybody like to to start on that? You know, uh, who's going to take responsibility for deployments as they're being uh, installed, and then in the in the long run, is it systems integrators? Is it a lead vendor? Is it the network operator themselves? Uh, does anybody want to to come in here with uh, with any thoughts on on where this is going? John, let's start with you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I sort of go back and, you know, in my history, I've built multiple networks around the world. And, and, and actually, what's, what you're seeing with OpenRAN is essentially no change in the process and who takes responsibility. Um, you know, the physical deployment of the elements, you know, is typically done by, you know, third party subcontractors, installation crews, tower crews, etc. Um, connectivity is provided by telcos and, 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 you know, putting those pieces together. Clearly that we, you know, where the, where, where the, uh, say confusion, but, but, you know, the fingers get pointed is who, who's going to project manage this. Um, and, uh, you know, who takes responsibility for the end to end to end performance of, of the network. Now, you know, depending on the operator, you know, some operators like to project manage this thing and man manage their subcontractors. Others like to, to, to farm the whole project out to, you know, a third party. And, and, and in that respect, Mavenir has been doing end-to-end -end system integration for the carriers today. Um, and then, you know, from, from an end-to-end -end system performance perspective, again, it's the same. Does the operator accept that or is that back to 
the, the, the project manager stroke, you know, for end-to-end system integrator. And, and again, you know, the vendors, you know, will step up to that. And, um, you know, you've got third-party drive test companies that have been driving networks today, you know, for closed round networks, no, nothing changes. And in, in, in respect, you know, what you come back to is who's holding the contract and then how you manage the subcontractors. So I think, there's, again, this is an area where, uh, you, you know, different vendors are coming in, different views being put on the table about how to build networks. But, um, you know, the whole process and the, the, the dynamics of building networks has certainly not changed in the last uh, uh, 10 plus years. And I'm not, I'm not seeing it change going forward. All you've got is different technologies being deployed with different skill sets. OK, thanks, John. Uh, Constantine, we'll come to you next and then to Francis. So, uh, uh, Constantine, who, who do you think is going to uh, be uh, taking responsibility at these different phases of open RAN deployments? Right. So the, there are two aspects uh, to the to the delivery, right, to the integration. One is uh, has to do with technology. The other has to do with uh, automation. So I think today in the early stages, uh, we are still going to see the same model. I agree. We are still going to see, you know, the system integrators taking charge of delivering the end to end solution or the operators managing the end to end solution for the obvious reasons. Uh, if we, if all the vendors adhere to the ORAN specifications, systems integration becomes a lot easier, right? It's a matter of staging the solution. Uh, the system integrator will still be involved probably, but uh, it becomes a lot easier to manage. Now, uh, longer term, and I would say probably in the next three to five years, uh, the issue of end-to-end uh, -end delivery and system integration is going to be really diluted because automation is going to put the power in the hands of the operator. They will, they will be able to literally upgrade or replace a DU, a critical part of the data plane, uh, from a single UI with a few clicks without disrupting operations without um, uh, compromising security or, uh, you know, uh, addressing any, you know, any challenge. So I think automation is going to come in and disrupt um, the, the existing model. <clears throat> and, and that is going okay. to be really transformational. That's what Oran brings to the table, the ability to exactly do that kind, to bring automation to bear in the run. Okay, uh, really interesting point there, Constantine. Thank you, uh, Francis. We'll come to you next, and then and then John will come back to you. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd actually emphasise what Constantine said and and John said, bringing them together. Really, um, you've got you, you've. I think the, the real challenge is, and most things haven't changed. It's it's how do I bring something that I'm used to buying as a single thing, and how do I bring that together and I think I think very much that bringing things together is up for grabs it could go to system integrators probably for tier one operators it's something that they could do themselves uh, for tier two example they will be looking for um, aspects of people that can bring that and 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 take effectively the lead role in in a, in a system integration project um, that could go a number of ways it could even go back to the traditional vendors because honestly I think the tra traditional vendors will increasingly have open RAM interfaces within their solutions it's just they will have integrated their own their own solution I think the other key thing is this whole idea of automation and I'd be more specific it's the whole way in which life cycle management of solutions is managed so how do I trust an integrated solution? How do I test the solution? How do I increasingly make that faster, more agile, swap in, swap out, smaller parts? And there, I think you're seeing an opportunity for uh, vendors. We recently went to the NEC lab, for example, in London, where they're, they're very much looking to create blueprints that are ready for deployment and ongoing testing of the solution. So that type of app, um, uh, situation, I think, will be, will be key in this area. But it's it's an opportunity for everybody um, in this area. Yeah, and of course we're seeing new organisations come forward and, and wanting to be that uh, uh, that company that uh, does it all for the operators. Uh, John, you wanted to come back in with some uh, additional points, I think. Yeah, so I, I I totally agree with the comments from Constantine and and, and uh, you, you know what 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 you're seeing is that there's two two aspects here. One is the build and integrate, just physically getting the network live, and then you know there's the continuous integration, continuous development process that that, that is essentially automated, and you know this is allowing you to really 
bring it all up from a central point. Once you've got IP connectivity out to the radio, um, then everything else can be done remotely. So, you know, the, the, the putting the features functionality, new features in there is almost like instantaneous and following the internet model um, where you could be swapping out features and swapping out software releases on a on a minute by minute, day by day basis and, and, and doing it on a selective cell site by cell site basis. So, you know, the whole, the whole thing about lifecycle management, I think, you know, I tend to treat separately as a separate discussion, but um, totally agree with the answers that have gone before. Okay, thank you, John. And uh, Itor, what's the view from from Vodafone given the the early experience you you have with your early rollouts? Yeah, so if I can give some clue about how we are um, targeting things, so basically there, there were tough discussions during our vendor selection about how to handle this complexity. So multi vendor at the end is adding a complexity of basically uh, whenever there is an issue. I mean, in the past with the traditional grand concept, I mean, you, you were pointing to that vendor specifically, but whenever there is a problem in, in a multi-vendor environment, you need to understand exactly or as soon as possible who should be solving the issue. And also, um, so, somebody, some entity acting as a coordinator to make sure that the different multi-vendors are aligned uh, is key. That, that perfectly could be a system integrator either from uh, uh, another entity, not exactly being the operator or or or, do, or, or acting as the operator as, as that as that role. No, what in our case, what we have, what we were very clear at the very beginning is that every single vendor needs to be accountable of what is happening. So if a KPI is degraded, all the vendors they are accountable. So at the end, in, in terms of accountabilities, all of them they need to make sure that they they, they solve the issue. Once it's very clear. And uh, who is uh, responsible? Uh, then I mean, it's up to that vendor to to solve the issue. Uh, I mean, and we 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 need to be very agile on this on this sense. So basically, uh, co coordinator uh, making sure that the different multi vendors are working fine. Each vendor being accountable of what is happening there. I'm I'm, I'm making sure that the, the vendor is is solving the issues. Then in our case, we are building a new organization on top of what uh, has been. So far on the traditional run to make sure that, for example, in our case, we, as, as Vodafone, uh, this organization is going to be given, given, um, given a, 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 a support to the different markets that we will be having uh, in the different countries, independently on whether the, we have the same vendors or different. So at the end, there is an organization taking care of uh, responsibility to make sure that at the end, um, I mean, the, 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 the issues are understood. There is a coordinator on top that, that is going to be handling the solutions for the different vendors. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, um, coordination and communication are absolutely important here. But I think the key message there is, if you're working with Vodafone, there is nowhere to hide. Uh, okay, great insights there, thanks very much. Uh, Guy, I think, do we have time uh, for one more question? Ray, I think we can just about squeeze in a quick final question, um, and it's okay. probably probably a, a good one to end with. This uh, we have our first six G question of the Open RAN Summit. Don't panic, everyone, because look, it's only seven years away. Let's face it. Uh, the question is: Given that the deployment and development of Open RAN is going to take many years, what considerations, if any? are being made for future 6G compatibility with open RAN architectures. Must these two be understood together or linked or, or must they be, be kept apart? Anybody want to cast their mind towards the future and, and, and look at, I mean, it's a serious question, you know, Constantine, great, we'll come to you first uh, because, you know, we, we, we are looking ahead and open RAN will be with us for a long time. Constantine. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have first uh, need, we, we first need to get uh, our act together on, on 5G, right? And uh, I think we will be very well positioned for 6G. Um, in fact, uh, Oran addresses exactly one of the key needs of 6G, as we can articulate what it is going to be, right, at this point, which is uh, primarily focused on uh, how we manage to uh, to do very effective, very powerful. Uh, beam forming, massive MIMO essentially, and bring intelligence throughout the network. 
leverage AI and machine learning throughout the network. So these are two of the key tenants of 6G, as we can uh, specify at this point. And if you really peel the, the, the layers of the onion, you see that to be able to deliver that capability, you need to have a software-driven radio. And that's exactly what Oran does. Uh, and I would go to the next uh, point and say, point out that the radio intelligent controller, which is, I keep calling it the operating system of the new radio architecture, is going to be essential to deliver the promise, um, and I have to be careful here, of 6G, right, which is intelligent uh, networks. Thanks, Constantine. Yeah, future-proofed open run. It's got to be future-proofed. Uh, great. Thanks very much for that. Uh, we'll, Francis, we'll come to you in a second, but first of all, let's go over to John. Yeah, I, I come back to the basic principles. You know, Open RAN is all about open interfaces and interoperability. It's actually technology agnostic. It's actually version G agnostic. So, um, you know, it's applicable to 5G, 6G and 10G, you know, and, uh, and hopefully I'm retired before 6G comes. So, um, but Open RAN is the way to go forward. We should not be producing any more specifications in 3GPP or any other standards that are proprietary and uh, basically create vendor locking. Yes, I hope we're all retired by the time 10G comes along, John. Um, Aito, let's come to you first. Yeah, so really challenging question. I mean, it's something that has been discussed already, even if, if it looks very far in time. So, I mean, generally speaking, the typical words or concepts that we are seeing for 6 d is uh, automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, this is not going to be probably about only run. So there are a number of different subdomains. Openness is happening everywhere. And probably the problem that is happening is each subdomain is working independently. So to make sure that at the end, this, uh, this uh, is, is, is orchestrated in, in the right way, all the different subdomains, I'm talking about run, transport, core, uh, services, platforms, and so on. Um, so I mean, that, 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 that needs to be working uh, Perfectly, right? Uh, we need to see as well the role that web scalers, other scalers uh, will, will have. So probably, I mean, each, each vendor, or, or sorry, each, each operator doing it or building its own equipment, 100% maybe it's not the, the right one. It's going to be disaggregation. It's going to be different components, even components. Now, in some cases, the radio unit will talk to the baseband, but even the components uh, inside the, the radio unit could be perfectly talking to a rig platform where the RIG platform is analyzing the efficiency of the different components and, and is uh, discussing actively how they could be uh, becoming more efficient by adapting and ensuring at the end the they, they, the resources are safe and the energy efficiency is achieved as well, right? So, well, that that's somehow a view, but I fully agree with the rest of the colleagues in the panel. All right, so thank you very much. We're going to leave the last words to Francis, so let's go first of all to Rima. Yeah. Um, as we at the platform vendor, right? We provide the platform. Our turnaround for release is about four to five months. So we're not afraid of 6G because we are pretty sure we'll be able to meet whatever requirements uh, the guys throw at us. But what I wanted to say is that what I want to see from 6G deployment is not how we're going to do it, but why are we going to do it? Um, what I would like to see as a consumer uh, and as a, you know somebody in the industry is that we move from 5G to 6G not because it's the new shiny thing, but because it actually offers us uh, to humanity, if you will, uh, to people as a whole, something that 5G doesn't. Uh, do we see that compelling reason to move forward and um, one of them that I heard uh, already is sustainability. Can it bring something in the area of sustainability that 5G is not offering? Or, uh, you know, some value, uh, some greater value that we can derive from it than just moving off to a new, uh, new interesting thing, which I'm all for because obviously I'm an engineer, I love new stuff. Uh, but I don't think it's a good enough reason to uh, invest and to work on something unless it's going to make our lives better. Thanks very much, Rima. And Francis, final thoughts on the relationship between Open RAN and 6G from you? 
Yeah, I, th I think the important thing here is that um, we need to recognise that with Open RAN um, and, um, and as we move increasingly to the uh, 5G standalone, everything is becoming software. That the, sure, there will be standards in terms of encoding mechanisms between the radio and uh, the UE, as, as an example. There may be new spectrum, but a lot of what would typically have been in a generational standard um, can actually be introduced using the RIC using X apps, using R apps. And you're already seeing that with things like, for example, Cahir's um, reverse Doppler effect, allowing us to introduce a new sort of um, uh, densification um, or, uh, or, or doubling of spectrum in that area. So I think we possibly uh, we need to start thinking about 6G as, as maybe being 6E. It's, it's an evolution. It's the evolution in LTE rather than it's a completely new generational standard, which we need to wait six years for. It will iterate. Um, and the final thing I would say is a lot of the things that 6G is looking at are things like AI, the introduction of AI. Again, all software. Thanks very much, Francis. Well, we are out of time now, so thank you to all of our guests who joined us for this live programme and to our audience for sending in questions. We still have several remaining, which we will add to the mix for tomorrow's show. Yep, do remember to send in your questions for the after show as soon as you can. Don't leave it too late. Uh, and don't forget the poll question. There's still time for you to have your say, so vote now. Yes, vote now and please join Ray and me again tomorrow for the final live after show for this year's Open Run Summit. Goodbye for now. The after show was recorded in front of a live online audience.